Hello, everyone. I'm Joel Whitney from Brooklyn Public Library uh, from our Arts and Culture Department, BPL Presents. Welcome to this Brooklyn Book Festival event, Hybrid Narratives with Mary Gates, Phil, Gary Gateskill and Sherry Turkle, moderated by Megan O'Rourke. Uh, for more from the library, you can follow our calendar at bklynlibrary.org or our social media at BPL Presents. Thanks for staying up so late to be with us tonight. These two acclaimed authors discuss their hybrid mode in The Devil's Treasure, Mary Gateskill has created a chimerical hybrid of fiction, memoir, essay, criticism, and visual art that transcends categorization. This collage of four novels interspersed with a single short story is a kind of director's cut, revealing the personal and societal forces that inform each individual piece of work. In The Empathy Diaries, Sherry Turkle ties together her coming of age and her pathbreaking research on technology, empathy, and ethics. Uh, growing up in post-war Brooklyn, Turkle searched for clues for her identity in a house filled with mysteries. Before empathy became a way to find connection, it was her strategy for survival. And this event will be moderated by the great Megan O'Rourke. Uh, Mary Gateskill is the author of Bad Behavior, Two Girls, Fat and Thin, Because They Wanted To, Veronica, Don't Cry, The Mare, Somebody with a Little Hammer, and This Is Pleasure. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, Esquire, Best American Short Stories, and the O. Henry Prize Stories. Sherry Turkle is the Abby Rockefeller Mauze Professor of the Social, Stud uh, Social Studies of Science and Technology in the Program in Science, Technology, and Society at MIT, and the Founding Director of the MIT Initiative on Technology and Self. Professor Turkle received a joint doctorate in sociology and personality psychology from Harvard University and is a licensed clinical psychologist. Professor, P Professor Turkle writes on the subjective side, quote unquote, of people's relationships with technology, especially computers. She is an expert on culture and therapy, mobile technology, social networking, and sociable robotics. Her newest book, of course, The Empathy Diaries, uh, which we'll discuss now. Megan O'Rourke is the author of The Long Goodbye and the Poetry Connection uh, Collection, Sun in Days, Once in Half-Life. The recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and other awards, she's the editor of the Yale Review. Her writing appears in the Atlantic Monthly, The New Yorker, The New York Times, and more. Please welcome all three of our speakers. Hi, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm Megan O'Rourke. It's a true delight to be here with two writers. I admired for a very long time. Um, so before we get started, we'd like to ask our authors to read for a few minutes. Um, and I think we're going to start tonight with Mary Gateskill. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm going to read from uh, the titular Devil's Treasure. Um, it's a short story which runs through the book that uh, is under discussion tonight of mine. Um, and it's a quite short story, but it links um, four novels and um, a memoir. When Ginger was seven, she went to hell. She'd first heard of it because her father said, what the hell, when something was funny. Then one day he came out of his bedroom shouting, this is hell, while her mother cried behind the door and it, it was not funny. His eyes were staring and he showed his teeth like a scared dog. When she asked her grandma, she asked her grandmother told her that hell was a made up place underground where people went to be tortured forever. Then she saw a cartoon in which the devil sat on a pile of treasure and laughed while demons poked dancing people in the behind with pitchforks. It didn't look like torture. It looked scary but interesting too. The night she went to hell, Ginger went to sleep in the bedroom she shared with her sister. They lay their heads on their pillows and their mother sang them, Tender Shepherd. One, say your prayers and two, close your eyes and three, safe and happily. Oh. And then Ginger went looking for hell. She didn't have to look far. Her spirit rose off her and walked through the house. The furniture watched her kindly. 
The only thing that called her was the sugar bowl from which she liked to sneak spoonfuls during the day. But her spirit didn't even stop for that. She went straight to the backyard and found the trap door that led to hell. It wasn't hard to open. The stairway down was clean and well lit. She thought, I'm going to steal the devil's treasure and put it under my bed, and I'll have it in the morning. As she ran down the stairs in her nighty, she noticed pictures on the walls. They showed faces and scenes, and they moved as she went past. In one picture, naked people were being beaten and driven by powerful men with no faces. It reminded her of the cartoon, and so she stopped to look at it. And then she was in it. Thank you so much, Mary, for that wonderful reading. And Sherry, I wonder if you would be so kind as to read a short passage. Yes, I've, I've chosen my passage because um, Mary's book uh, has this underlying myth that weaves its way through the book. And my book also has a myth of a search, uh, a quest for a missing father. And so I'm just going to read a bit of that initial moment where I begin my quest. During the long hours of my grandmother's dying, I begin to read the Brooklyn telephone book. I look up the Charles Zimmermans. There are pages of them. I study the entries carefully. It's August 1975. I'm 27. For as long as I can remember, I've been both searching and not searching for Charles Zimmerman, my father, whom I haven't seen since childhood. Now I'm searching. In the back of one of my graduate school notebooks, I begin to copy down Charles Zimmerman addresses and telephone numbers, long lists of them. My mother is dead and my grandparents with whom I stay when I'm in New York have only the Brooklyn telephone book, no Manhattan directory. I know that in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one of my Harvard professors has the Manhattan directory in his office. He once commented that everyone needs to have that directory at hand. At the time, this idea suggested a life of access and sophistication that thrilled me now, though, I feel a more practical need. When I get back to school, I ask his secretary if I may borrow his Manhattan book. She says no, but she lets me sit with it in his office, where I carefully copy out new Zimmerman candidates. My grandmother dies in December at LaGuardia Airport, flying back to Boston after her funeral. My plane is delayed. Standing next to a payphone, I study the Queen's directory and copy down the information for all its Charles Zimmermans. It never occurs to me that my father might live in the Bronx or have moved out of New York City altogether. Both during my mother's long life, both during my mother's life and long afterward, I had respected my mother's wish to keep secret what she considered the great shame of her early divorce. I never spoke of my biological father. More than this, from the time I was five and my mother remarried, this was to Milton Turkle, my family lived under a regime of pretend. The rules were that although my legal name was Sherry Zimmerman, I had to say that my name was Sherry Turkle. I met now with a private investigator, a former police detective. I no longer remember his name, just his thin black hair and shiny gray suit. In the spring of 1979, 
I visited his small bare office on the west side, furnished with only a well-used lamp, a coat tree, and a steel desk. After Thanksgiving, the detective called. He thinks that he's found my Charles Zimmerman. I remember that as we spoke, I could only take shallow breaths. I was crossing a line. My mother had not wanted me to do this. Perhaps she'd had her reasons. Thank you both for those readings. Um, it's really wonderful to hear the, the books out loud. So, you know, it's funny, we had a little bit of a uh, prior back and forth by email, right, which sometimes you don't want to do because you don't want to leave the best material on the cutting room floor, but it gave us a great starting point, which is that we were all talking about how, in some sense, this two books are not an obvious pair, right? Um, Mary, your book is this kind of distinctive collage that I'll let mm -hmm. you kind of. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, is a sort of distinctive collage of, you know, your novels, your memoir, and then this new short story. Um, I don't know if it's new, but this, I think, believe unpublished, formerly unpublished short story that threads its way through and that in some ways relates directly to your previous novel, The Mayor. Um, it has visual art in it. And then Sherry, your book is a memoir of, you know, kind of post-war Brooklyn, growing up with your family, coming of age, the finding your way to Radcliffe and Harvard and the life of the mind. But as we were talking about, there is this quest through line um, in which in both books, a, a kind of fierce and determined young woman goes, a young girl goes in search of, search of knowledge. And in both books, in a sense, the knowledge turns out to be something different from what one expects at the beginning or what she expects. So I wonder whether each of you see your books this way, um, what led each of you to write the particular book you wrote? And I know you've both read each other's books, so it might be interesting to, to talk a little bit about how you see the two in relationship. That's three questions in one, but to start with, what led each of you to write this particular book and, and did the quest change as you wrote? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I wrote this book because I'd always wanted to read a book like this. Um, my book tells the story of the passion behind someone's work. Uh, my interest in uh, the undermining of empathy in digital culture, a story I've been telling really for over 30 years, um, is not just a job. <laughs> It's, it's not my job. It's yeah. really a, um, it's really a quest. I mean, it's a, I began by being a, a, a very, I was on the cover of Wired magazine. I was someone who was uh, not smitten, but really uh, deeply curious uh, about uh, our new digital lives. I saw lots of interesting things in it, our new identity. I talked about a new place for uh, looking at identity, programming as a new place to explore identity. And then I began to see things that deeply disturbed me. Um, um, and particularly in undermining a, a capacity for empathy, a, a, a capacity for solitude, which of course is where empathy begins. And I realized that this theme touched me so deeply because of the life I had led and the importance of empathy in that life. And I thought, this is the story that's not told when people read a scientist, when people read a social scientist. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell that story. I wanted to tell uh, how the life meets the work. And I see so much in Mary's book uh, in the way she revisits her novels and says, well, here's what was going on for me. Here's when I wrote this, here's how I would rethink this. That, that isn't, of course, the same impulse, but has that same revisiting of a work uh, through, an author, you know, through uh, the author now. So I found, um, I found her book deeply moving because of what had compelled me to write my book. Mm, that's a beautiful answer. Mary, do you want to jump in? 
Yeah, that, that makes sense, just to follow up on that, because um, in, at first glance, the books have very little in common, but it's true that um, the way I was looking at my past work has a sort of relationship with what Sherry was doing and connecting the really deep emotional roots of her, how her thinking came into being um, and blending very slowly and subtly blending that with uh, the her, her emotional growth or her emotional, I don't even, it, it's under, selling, under describing it to call it a journey. Um, to to what she came to as an adult and how the the construction of her life as an intellectual the underpinnings were that connect close intimate connection with her mother and her aunts and her dealings with her father and that's that does have a relationship to what I'm doing in this book which was almost an accident it's not something I ever would have thought to do by myself it, it I didn't I would never have thought to do this book by myself. I did it because my friend Michael um, decided to do this small imprint called Z Books. And he, this is kind of what he wanted to do a collage of work. He did it with a couple of another writer named Nick Flynn before me. And I thought, well, okay, I can do that. But it turned into this really amazing and strange project that took me in sort of directions that wouldn't have occurred to me where I did look back at the emotional underpinnings of some of the things I'd written, which I thought I'd done, but I hadn't in the same way. And this story in particular is kind of a strange thing because it's a real dream I had when I was six. I, I did dream that I went to hell and stole the devil's treasure, which is a very, it's, the story is more elaborate than the actual dream. But I kept thinking about this, and why would a six-year-old dream of such a thing? I'm guessing it was a possible response to, um, I hope it's okay to say this, being molested repeatedly by um, a neighbor and family friend, <laughs> hell in the backyard, um, and just my bewilderment and at the proximity of being confronted so early with the closeness of pain and evil with love and normalcy and just a profound sense of mystery about that and trying to get knowledge, trying to get literally get to the bottom of it to try to understand something that was really impossible for me to understand and which I was trying to understand even as I write working on this book. And I don't, I don't think I finally grasped as I was thinking, why would I want to steal? What was I trying to steal? What did I want? And I realized literally in the last pages, I wasn't stealing anything. I was trying to take something back. And I, I was willing to go to hell to get it. Yeah, that's such an incredible moment in the book where the, a flip happens in the metaphor from the devil's treasure goes from being something that the, the little girl Ginger is seeking to something that you as the, the kind of meta textual writer meditating on this, is able to then see as right a recovery of that which has been lost. You know, it's it's really impossible not to read both of these books together and think about the ways that secrets early in life, um, you know, the, the regime of pretend, as I believe you call it, Sherry, entire entire real intellectual and aesthetic life for decades to come. And I wonder if and, and sort of. Relatedly, both of you in your, your books um, share a kind of search for something Mary talks about as sort of a, in, in our emails as a, a deeper truth beneath the quotidian. And both of you are very interested in the construction of selfhood. I wonder to what degree you think um, that burden of the secret early in life did shape your sense of who you became and how you, how you shape the books here. Certainly for me, um... My mother was married to Charles Zimmerman. I'm the child of that marriage. And she was determined that this marriage not be known and that I never use the name Zimmerman and that I hide and never speak and never know and never be known by my, by my father's identity. And the original title of the book was The Memory Closet, 
because there's a cupboard in my grandparents' uh, kitchen where I seek, where I'm, where I'm at this closet. From the time I'm, I'm a, almost a baby, I have recollections of standing on the kitchen table, rifling through this closet as a two-year-old, as, as soon as I could stand, looking for pictures of, of my father, not knowing what I'm looking for. There, that's where all the pictures of the family are kept and my mother's books and, and, and little trinkets and pictures of her boyfriends. And, you know, I, I'm just looking for, it's, it's where everything from the family, you know, it's, it's, it's like in, our, in this tiny three, one bedroom apartment where five adults live, is, is, that's the closet. And I'm seeking and I'm seeking and I'm seeking what they don't know I'm looking for. They know I'm looking for, but they don't know how to stop me because we can't even say his name. I'm looking for some trace of my father. And I finally find a picture where the face of the man is cut out, but I see his shoes. I see that his pants are tweed. And, and I, I, I determined that this must be my father and this memory uh, stays with me all my life. And uh, what for me, the, 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 the mystery becomes is why these adults who loved me so intensely, why these adults who loved me so intensely were keeping, were making me the holder of this secret and making me lie about my name. And that mixture of love and lying led me to this desire to empathize with them because they didn't hate me. It was, it was, I had to understand, get into their minds of how people who loved you so much would want you would put you in this position. And I think that that combination of the love and the lying caused me to make empathy or trying to get into their heads or to solve this mystery, mm -hmm. put that at the center of my concerns and, and, and deeply shaped me because it wasn't like people who didn't care about me were asking me to, to lie. Um, and and it, it 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 deeply shaped my, my all these psychoanalyses later I can I can I attest I, I testify that it's the love and the lying together the secret and the secret and the love yeah, that, that I, profoundly shaped my character. It's such yeah that particular combination as you put it and of course in your case too that they were erasing your very name and and sort of yes. Old. And then I go on to study the first, the first object of my study, Jacques Lacan, mm -hmm. whose theory of, of identity and, and selfhood is, is that the center of everything is le nom du père, the name of the father, uh, which of course is exactly what I didn't have. And that of course was not, I believe that was truly overdetermined. Yes, it's very novelistic, in fact. Um, yeah, I wanna come back to Lacan and your later work, but Mary, maybe you could talk a little bit about- You're frozen. Oh, can you see me? No, hang on. Am I here? I think it's Mary who may have frozen. Oh, so Mary's frozen and we're, so you know what, I'll go back to Sherry then while we wait for Mary. Oh, here's Mary, there you are. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I had so much kind of response to what Sherry was saying. I'm not sure I can condense it very well. Um, I, I didn't exactly experience direct lying. And I, I kind of I hesitate to make this all about my autobiography because it's what I wrote isn't exactly a memoir. But um, I do think uh, I had a kind of experience, which was, I, I'm not sure there was a whole lot of love in my family, honestly. Um, there, there people use the word, but um, I, I can't say, I wouldn't say this if my parents were still alive, but they're not. Um, so I, I think I had also a similar need to empathize or to 
try to find what I might call a back channel to get to the emotional reality because I didn't know what it was. Mm. Um, I saw, you know, there was talk of love, but I didn't see a whole lot of loving behavior. And um, they, my mother didn't, I, I don't want to, but it, it just said there was no protection. There was no, when I was telling the truth, I wasn't believed. Um, and so I very much was constantly trying to find some, some thread where there was real tenderness and real, real regard and love. And, and there was, it's just kind of, I had to like find wind my way around an awful lot of uh, stuff to, to get it, to get to it. Uh, a lot of pain and, and fear and injury on the part of my parents. And so that, that very much has affected, has informed my writing, not, not entirely, there's other things that have informed it. And it's why this story, I think I chose the story of the double treasure for it. Pardon me? Froze for a second, but you're back. We, we have to why the story, you were at a cliffhanger. It's why the story. Oh, why the story of the devil's treasure was a sort of perfect unifying narrative is that it, it's, it's about this um, in, intense desire to find and understand what's really there and what may really be precious in, in a, a, a just kind of a huge um, landscape of confusion. I remember I quoted Nabokov in one of my emails to you, this love was like an endless wringing of the hands, um, sort of blundering through an infinite maze of hopelessness and remorse in a strangely opposite. Yeah, it's an amazing quote. Well, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that your book, so much of your book is made up of fiction, right? And as you said, you did, you haven't written a memoir here. You've really written a truly hybrid piece of work. And I think we need to talk about that big word in the title of this panel. And I'm curious, as, as someone who, I kind of work in various hybrid spaces as a poet and as a nonfiction writer, um, do you think about the word? Were you thinking of this as a hybrid text, Mary, when you wrote it? I'm also really curious, did you already have the short story, The Devil's Treasure, or did that story come to be as you collaged the pieces of the book, which are, of course, from other books of yours, including novels and short story collections? Or no, I had it. Um, it was I had it was written and I did not consider hybrid. I wasn't yeah. thinking about that at all. Um, my my thing was to like do what I needed to do to put this book together in an interesting way and make it make sense. Yeah. Um, but the I, and I didn't think of the devil's treasure at first. I was thinking primarily of novels. But it, it's an odd thing that I wrote that story because it can kind of came out of the blue to me years ago. And I considered it in connection with at, at first I thought, oh, this actually works really well with the mayor. Um, and I even named the character eventually Ginger. Um, but it also, I think sometimes in writing fiction, we don't write in a linear way or rationally. I think sometimes some part of our mind knows well ahead. Um, and, and I sometimes write out of sequence when I'm working on a book. It's like you, you know, some part of you knows this is where you're going before your rational mind knows. Um, and I, I find this an absolutely just the perfect place to use that story. Oh, that's really fascinating. And, and were you thinking of other art forms at all with this book? Because it really does have, well, the publisher uses the word collage. And of course there are visual collages in it. It made me think too of, um, Joel used the phrase director's cut or remixes in music. And in fact, reading it made me think, wait, why are we not all doing this? This is an incredibly revelatory reading experience. It was like getting to read you as your own, elucidator, critic, reflect, I don't know, it was really cool and very metatextual, but but also totally organic in the end. And I wondered, did you have to go to other art forms for that model? Did it come very intuitively as I'm hearing? Maybe it did. It did. Can, is it okay if I show a picture? Yeah, please, yeah. I hope this works out. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the collages I did. Um, it's a little bit rough here. But yeah, they did come to me intuitively. Um, 
they were kind of a perfect thing to do during the pandemic. This was this one is for um, I came to be in connection with the, the, a death scene um, in the novel. If anybody knows it, Veronica, um, Veronica dies in a terrible and she is alone. It's not on the face of it dramatic like that, but I feel like it, it's like that. The, this the pressure, the suffering is pressing down on her, but she's like pressing up she's she's almost ascendant even as she's being pressed down and she's coming from like this murk into this extraordinary hyper existence and that figure behind is like somebody eating something mm -hmm. and, and um integrating it integrating experience integrating the experience of life on earth the terrible experience she had like digesting it and through that, through that of pain and also the digestion of it just like coming out into a completely new place. But I didn't think of that. I just put the pictures together and then I knew that's what it was. <laughs> Sherry, I wanted to turn to this, to you with this question of, of hybrid. Um, at one point in your book, you say, and I just wanna find the exact quote if I can, you said, I wanted to do academic work that put thinking and feeling on the same floor. And I so loved that very pithy expression of it. And it seems to me that this book does that, right? The book yes. is kind of manifestation of your own work. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I did um, uh, think, I'm not sure hybrid is the word I used, but when I when I saw the word hybrid and title, I said, yes, my work that does describe my book yeah. because um, it's hybrid in the sense, very much hybrid in the sense that I describe an experience and right. then I right away tell you how this experience illustrates, was a precursor, got me started on a larger intellectual project. In other words, I root my intellectual projects in life experiences yeah. um, that I didn't have any trouble finding. In other words, I, 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 I lived the fact that thought and feeling uh, go together or as I sometimes say, we, we love the objects we think with, we think with the objects we love. Um, so that when I'm describing Jacques Lacan trying to explain to me uh, an idea of, uh, of, of there never being a, a centered self and he we're in a restaurant and he's, and, and there are these smoked mirrored, uh, smoked mirrored glasses in front of us and behind us. And he, he points to our reflection in front and then we're reflected behind, you know, how you get the infinite repetition of, of images that never end. And he, he says, you see, you, you, it, it never ends. And that's how, you know, there never is a stable sense of the, of the eye and he's he's trying he's 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 so nice to me i know so little and he's sort of explaining to this novice you know sort of how it this the infinite re regression of the you know and i and i'm so uninvested in seeming smart to him or you know clever and i say oh my oh my god why don't you explain it that simply in your, in your, in your, in your writing. And he says, it, it's not supposed to be simple. You're supposed to spend your life reading me. You know, I, I, I then go on to explain in the book a little bit about Jacques Lacan and what, you know, and it's, and so, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I make an effort to, um, to tell the stories of the moment as I lived them and how then they brought me to larger questions. Uh, I tell the story of the moment that I'm in a lecture when I realize that I'm, I'm studying Le Nom du Père 
and I don't have a nom du père. And, and I really try to capture how that hadn't occurred to me before. You know, so I, I, the, for me, the hybridity is a perfect, um, is a perfect way to describe my methodology in the book where I tell the story of the moment of my life and then link it to the larger intellectual question that I then pursued. So I, um, I'm very comfortable with that as a methodology in, you know, in my, really in my research where I tell a story from a life history or a fragment of an interview. And I feel that in this book, I just turn the lens on myself. And it was a very, emotional, uh, you know, a very emotional experience, but one that, um, you know, but, but one that I, I, you know, I feel in which I tried to seamlessly as possible uh, tell the moment in my life and then open it out to the larger question. Well, I certainly experienced it as incredibly seamless and refreshing that the story is the story of a, a you know, a girl and then a young woman's like coming of mind as it yes, were. Yes, coming of mind. Exactly. That's a nice way to put it. I just, Less coming of age of coming of mind. Yeah. Coming of mind. And there's so few books like that, especially written by women. I mean, I think we've got a lot of them from men, but thank God. Right. We but I really appreciated that, you know, there's love in there and there's high school boyfriends, but they play like very <laughs> Right. Love affairs with ideas. And of course, with your husband. Right. There's this real palpable passion. And I think because of that, it, it does feel really effortless to the reader. That said, having just finished a book where I'm weaving together narrative and exposition, I imagine it wasn't at first easy, or maybe it was reading your book made me realize, oh, I wish I'd read your book two years ago when I was struggling. Was it easy to write? No, it was not easy to write. I, I tried to make, when I said effortless, I meant I tried to make it easy for you to read. And I didn't mean it was easy to write, no. <laughs> it made it feel effortless. In fact, I'm very jealous of both your books in that sense. Um, um, uh, I, I was informed recently by a psychoanalyst, by the way, that jealous is, you know. No, no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> On the other or Envy is the bad thing. Right. Jealous is the good thing. That's the correct word here, but no, I, I really, um, these are just two tremendous books. I hope everyone who's who's um, here today and hasn't read them will seek them out, but you both make it look so easy to write about what might feel unsayable, unspeakable, hard to capture. Um, you do it in very different ways. You know, sure, you have this very, I think Mary was calling it kind of bright and direct style. It doesn't shatter sure. hardness. Yeah. And then Mary, I think of you as just the you have such a gift with finding grounded metaphors for that which can't be put into kind of transactional literal language. And I just wondered if you could talk about whether you thought about these books as in some ways dealing with what have been unspeakable to others, what is unspeakable, what to you are unsayable and finding ways to say it or whether that wasn't, you know what I'm saying? Both of you are kind of writing toward um, uh, Mary, as you put it, the indecipherable code. And I thought it was interesting that the word code was in there. And of course, Sherry, you study programmers, but I, I was hinging on that, um, this idea of writing as a way of trying to understand something about what it is to be human and what remains illegible to us despite our kind of normalization of the day to day. Well, I have a quote from Mary that describes what I thought was re a revelation in reading Mary's book is that she describes relationships that just that that perfect that that are so um, universal mm -hmm. that they could have been about characters in my members of my family. So here she describes two characters. She says. Mm -hmm. She behaved as if she wanted to win his love, but she was playing the loser so aggressively that it was almost impossible for him to respond with love. Mm -hmm. And she could have been talking about my Aunt Mildred and my grandfather, Robert Bonowitz. Yeah. My aunt was so 
desperate for the love of her father. Mm. And she never had his love because he envied her relationship with his wife, her mother. And she cared for him. She cared for him after his wife died, when she was the daughter who took care of him. She wanted him to, she never married. She wanted him to approve of her, to, to be, to recognize what she had done for him, how she had cared for him and been loyal to him. And he, he, he could never give her that recognition. Yeah. And that was, and, and what I loved about Mary's book was that, was that kind of naming, this ability to, 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 to name these universal relationships, the, 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 the um, taboo of the jealousy and the difficulties of mother-daughter relationships. I mean, in, in my book, I describe a moment where I, I call it the, the, the one moment for which I would want to do over with my mother, where, where I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to separate from her I'm trying to show my anger at her for keeping my father from me. And it's the moment when she brings me to Radcliffe and she wants to participate in my moment of triumph. And I criticize her for having a hair clip in her hair, which shows us to be the kind of lower middle class people that we are. And I just do it because I'm so angry at her. And, and Mary talks about the, the, the taboos in mother-daughter relationships. I mean, so I, I think that, uh, and of course, abuse and, and what can't be said when there's abuse. I'm thrown into a, a my mother throws me into a, a shower with my naked stepfather and how that's never discussed. I mean, and Mary captures those moments. So um, I, I think that, um these books that are about such different things they're they're ultimately about families and these mo and these you know in these moments that are universal i don't know if mary felt the same way about the yeah. universality of what she's captured oh yeah um and beyond families even just to like but yeah i really I, I unfortunately those characters you mentioned in my book were actually that was the memoir part. I didn't <laughs> of them. My yes. sister and my father had a pretty terrible relationship, but sad. But actually, I think loving finally. But what you know, let's not go there anymore. But yeah, the the indecipherable code, the 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 no one was in the building and I was crying and she knocked on the door I, I didn't know anybody was there she knocked on the door and said are, are you okay and I, I was horrified that she'd heard me but I told her what was happening my father had just died and we went out to lunch and she, she, she talked, talked about, about the things, things her her family and children were still alive but the things that people she said she she said she in the midst of saying something cruel or just indifferent or uncaring, she would catch herself and she would think, why am I saying this? And couldn't stop herself. It's, it's so strange, these patterns that people get into that's like, almost like, I wish we could talk more about the theme of persona and masks because I know that's a concern of yours and it certainly is of mine. And that, that, that kind of locked in personality that happens that where the small kind of alive thing just gets smothered and it, it's a very mysterious thing about human beings that that happens, but it seems to happen a lot. That was going to be my next question, so I'm so glad you brought it up. Um, but as Mary, as you're saying, there's quite a deep interest in both books in persona and masks and Sherry, of course, in your own academic work into sort of digital identities. And I wonder if, yeah, you might respond to what Mary was saying. And, and Mary, I think of in your work too, that, that both books are in different ways 
really incisively and deeply and kind of profoundly interested in performance as well, right? And how we perform selves to each other and the cruelty that that, you know, hides or allows to, but yeah, Sherry, maybe you would jump in there. Yes, um, there's, a, there's a part of my book where I uh, describe after my mother's death, when I uh, in no way am ready to mourn her, because in fact, I mean, I should say, spoiler alert, it's only when I find my father and realize that my mother left him for cause, he was in fact performing experiments on me and she left him in order to save me. Yeah. And the tragedy is that she couldn't talk to me about this. She wanted to protect me from him and she felt this needed to be a secret. So it's when I find him that I lose him as a fantasy, but I, after long after her death, I reconcile with her. So in finding my father, I lose him, but can reconcile with her. And when I, long before this happens and she dies and I flee from Radcliffe, I flee from my life to go to Paris and I take on the mask of a cleaning lady. They call me Le Portuguese, they're Portuguese because all the other cleaning ladies were Portuguese. So I'm a cleaning lady, I'm a student at Sciences Po, I'm really terrified, I'm just a terrified child. And I take on the mask of the French language and think of myself as French Sherry, because in fact, the English girl and the English speaking girl inside, the Sherry Sherry, is so frightened and lost and has lost her every identity on, on the shell. But the French Sherry has no, who's a cleaning lady and a Sciences Po student and has no money and just has to live from day to day, mm. has no choice but to succeed. And in this new French language, wearing this mask, I, I have to be pulled together. I have to succeed. I, 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 I have nothing to fall back on. And I talk about how wearing this mask as French Sherry keeps me sane and grounded and resourceful in a way that English speaking Sherry could not. And it's a, it's a sort of story. It's a story of assuming an idea. It, oh, it's, it's, a, it's, and, and, it, and that again, in terms of hybridity, that story, telling that story of French Sherry, the mask of French Sherry allows me to talk about psychology and identity and masks and Eric Erickson and, and object relations theory and allows yeah. me to tell the story of kind of my psychological development and mourning my mother at that time. So um, again, I found that in, in, in Mary's work too. I, I think I have a quote here about, you know, about how she talks about masks and, and I found that the, the, the notion of, of masking uh, really um, uh, helped me, you know, also later in my life when I studied uh, people in cyberspace who used masking and assuming identities online, I show the reader how my own experience with masking as a part of my construction of identity at a time of crisis helped me develop an empathic and sympathetic understanding of what was going on in the online world. Mm. So that's a perfect example of how the hybridity of my book, personal experience and intellectual experience, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, worked for me. You know, and that makes me think, Mary, and we're gonna wrap up in a sec, but I, I do think about your work too. And there's a quote that, um, I love in the book, how could I do otherwise when the violence of the unsaid things became so great that it kept me awake at night? All the meat of truth was hidden under a dry surface. And so we tore off the surface with a shout. 
We wanted to have everything revealed and made articulate, everything, even our greatest embarrassments and lusts. The words are so simple and literal, but for me, they evoke moral chaos and the difficulty of seeing clearly. It goes on from there, but I think of both of these books being about moral chaos and the difficulty of, um, of seeing clearly. And as we wrap up, do either, you know, would either of you like to add anything? I, I could keep talking to you for an hour, but you know, our time, our official time is coming to an end. <laughs> Well, I would just, I found the wonderful quote from Mary uh, about shapes and masks. <laughs> she says, I came to feel, and because this struck me so much when I was thinking about friend Sherry, I came to feel the connection that between that warm, live inner character and the outer mask that gave it expression in the world. Mm -hmm. And to me, that summed, you know, that summed up, um, so much about uh, not denigrating the idea of what the mask was, and it took but me, seeing its role. It took me a very, very long time to get there because I actually was terrible at that kind of construction of persona. I, it terrified me. I, I didn't partly because I I left home at fifteen and I was really put into a world that was, there was you know kind of really um, complex and harsh situations. And I was not a sophisticated 15 year old. I was um, really socially awkward and just kind of was thrown into things that I had no ability to deal with. And so it was just simply impossible when presented with all that raw material, I did not know how. I couldn't even do it in high school or junior high school to figure out how to make a persona that made any sense at all. And so I'm really acutely aware of that, how that, how so many people, that's why I really worked with that in Veronica, how that, how some people like their lives are terrible because they can't get the output right. They just can't, they can't put it together right. And it's a tragedy because nobody even sees them because they don't know how to put forward a persona. And this seemed horrible to me. And I was kind of like Megan was quoting, I was kind of a generational thing as let's get, I don't want this shit. This is ugly and gross. But then eventually as an adult, I, I understood that, you know, these things that people create to protect themselves, they have a, sometimes there is a very delicate and beautiful relationship between that structure that sometimes can be very forbidding. It's a kind of private delightfulness, the, the inner thing and the outer thing and I, I finally got that as an adult and began to enjoy playing with that. I remember at one point in your book, Sherry, you, you talked about the importance of having an ability as a young person to do things wrong and mm -hmm. to have to take on things that you can then throw off. And I didn't get that. I didn't know how to do that or until I had the freedom to do it really until I was in my late 30s, early 40s. And people thought I was childish, but it was a really important thing for me to be doing to have that adolescent experience. Right. Well, this has really been such a wonderful conversation for me to get to sit in on. So thank you both for, for writing the truly extraordinary books that, that brought us here. And I want to thank our late night audience for being here, um, to thank, of course, Sherry and Mary, and to really encourage you to use the button on your Crowdcast to go buy their books and show your support in the most material way. Um, I really can't think of two other books I'd more recommend from this year. So Sherry and Mary, thank you so much for, for coming and sharing your work with us tonight. Thank you. you thank it was you, really this good. has been such a pleasure. Hard job for you, Megan. <laughs> you did it, you did it really well. You about, but really, I just I just let you talk. Um, and thanks to the Brooklyn Public Library for hosting all of us.